What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the HQ. This is Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football BDGE. I am Nicholas. I am also slightly dead because it's Sunday night and I got back from the Jersey Shore about an hour ago and I gotta get this video out to y'all. So if I appear semi passed away, that is why. I'm gonna try to bring as much energy as I got, but stay with me. We're talking about rookie wide receivers. We broke down rookie running backs few weeks ago, I want to close out the case. I want to talk about some of the rookie wide receivers that, that I see could possibly have an impact in fantasy football this year, because we know that rookie wide receivers predominantly don't produce at a rate in which, you know, uh, we see a lot of rookie running backs who can be RB1s immediately, or RB2s at worst, or a plethora of RB3s every single season, right? So with rookie wide receivers, we rarely get that, especially the last few years. We've, we've, I haven't seen someone kind of break out since 2014 when it was the Odell or the Kelvin Benjamin, even Mike Evans, whatever, you know, surpassing a thousand yards. And these rookie wide receivers, yeah, a good year might be considered 600 yards, but that's not really usable in your fantasy lineup. So I want to break down whether or not I see any of these guys being actually fantasy relevant. I'll try to touch on all of them that were within like the first three rounds, but I really want to break down the guys that I think um, can have a major impact immediately in 2019 fantasy football. So that's it. Top rookie wide receivers. Let's get it. So we'll cover Marquise Brown because he was the first wide receiver off the board to the Baltimore Ravens. He is a smaller type receiver. I'm sure you know much about him by now. He's like 5'9", I think 166 pounds. The guy can flat out break your defense down, down the field, played with Baker, put up big numbers at OU. Then he dealt with this Liz Frank foot injury. So I will be the first one to say like, yes, he might be exciting and he might be something in a couple of years, but I don't think there's any reason for you to even come close to touching him in a redraft this year. There are three major concerns when I look at it. You have one, just the size overall. If we're looking at uh, the any you know any group of wide receivers that we've ever seen come to the NFL, what percentage of guys his size have we ever seen be successful? Like very, 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 very rarely. So him breaking out of that size mold would be a tremendous, um, you know, going against the grain there, going against the trends and the majority of what we've seen happen. So you're betting against that one. Two, this Liz Frank foot injury. This Liz Frank foot injury is, is definitely very serious. It's a very serious injury for wide receivers because you use your foot so frequently to, um, to plant, right? And that really dictates everything in your game as a wide receiver, whether it's a speed, whether it's cutting across the middle. So he's got to come back from that. And I know he is rehabbing well um but he missed the combine because of it and if he pushes himself too quickly too hard you know there's a very high chance of re-injury everything injury related um dr jesse morse will be back on the channel on wednesday actually we won't be discussing marquise brown yet hollywood but that will be in the draft guide so on bigdogsdraftguide.com dr morse does like 40 to 50 injury write-ups which you will get his rating one to nine one to ten whether or not you know we think that they are going to be an injury risk in 2019 fantasy football basically so we have the injury risk we have the size and then we just have lamar jackson throwing the ball right this is a team that ran the ball the most out of any team in the nfl last year so they're going to be a very run heavy team and we have not seen any semblance of accuracy from Lamar Jackson yet. So there are just way too many red flags to actually expect him to do anything productive in his rookie year. Will he be a major prospect or will he be a major player in the NFL? Maybe in two years, three years. But I just because he was the first wide receiver off the board does not blanket the fact that there's a lot of red flags around him. The second receiver off the board, the last pick in the first round, was Nikhil Harry to the New England Patriots out of Arizona State. Now, y'all probably know I love Nikhil Harry. This guy's a monster, like 6'2", 6'3", 225 to 230 pounds. His combine numbers are also fantastic. I don't see very many glaring holes in his game whatsoever. 4'5", 340 yard dash puts him in the 91st percentile given his speed. Now he's got first round draft capital. He broke out at age 18. That's in the 95th percentile. And I've broken down why breakout ages are so important. Um, if you missed my dynasty sell high, buy low video, I kind of broke down the numbers and talking about breakout age and college dominator and Nikhil Harry hits everything. He is He's not one dimensional either. He's not just big and, and can run fast down the field. He's a guy that they used heavily in the screen game at Arizona State. He makes plays after the catch, but he also has a size that he can get up and make plays in the end zone. So 
coming to the Patriots offense, they have, you know, 71 targets missing from Gronk. They have 51 from Hogan, 67 from Josh Gordon, depending on whether or not he comes back. So they have like over 190 targets missing from their pass catching group. The way I see it, Nikhil Harry is going to step in as the number one outside guy there. Now I know like we haven't really heard that many reports of Nikhil Harry at camp so far. The only thing we've heard is that he's kind of struggled against Stefan Gilmore, which is completely expected considering Gilmore is one of the best man coverage D-backs in the entire NFL. So if he wasn't struggling, you'd be like, holy shit, there's a reason why I had him at 101 the entire time. He has not changed whatsoever in my rookie dynasty rankings. 101 still is that guy for me. Checks all of the boxes as a prospect. And you pair him with Brady, I think they're going to be able to, like, they're a team that really knows how to utilize their best players. And they know what Harry can do on the line of scrimmage. They use a lot of quick hitting throws, right? That you see a lot with Julian Edelman. I think it, despite the size differences, I, I think we'll see a lot of similar work between Nikhil Harry and Julian Edelman. And not to mention, like, Chris Hogan obviously was horrible last year. But two years ago, look how Chris Hogan was used. He was used really successfully down the field as a deep threat and in the end zone, right? He scored, like, what was it, um, five, six ish touchdowns within like seven games before he ended up um tailing off and getting hurt he was also a very big deep threat his average at the target was like 17 or 18 yards on the field and i can totally see them using harry in the same sense but also behind the line of scrimmage because he's so good with the ball in his hand so harry is someone i do expect to uh, be in the conversations throughout the year as someone that you will be debating in the flex rankings do i think he'll break out and be like a legit fantasy wide receiver too I wouldn't be surprised whatsoever, but I would probably hold the reins back a little bit. I think he'll probably start off a little bit slow and then he'll get acclimated and have a couple big games and then we can get excited about him. So probably a second half of the year type breakout player, but I wouldn't be surprised if in the preseason, you know, we see him connect with Brady on that first team offense and catch two touchdowns or something. And then his ADP spikes right up. So I like Harry a lot. He's my favorite um, wide receiver that came out of this draft, arguably with AJ Brown. Now, AJ Brown obviously has the horrible landing spot to the Tennessee Titans. Now that's just a fuck situation. You know, if Corey Davis couldn't really do it with 27% of the targets last year, AJ Brown is now splitting that with Corey Davis, as well as Adam Humphreys. And they're going to be running the ball a lot with Derrick Henry. So AJ Brown, if, if it was switch situations, like if AJ Brown had gone to a really good situation, he would be my one-on-one, no questions asked. He is another prospect that comes out of Ole Miss, split time with DK Metcalf, split time with Demarcus Lodge. So two other NFL wide receivers in the group in college and still absolutely dominated from a production standpoint. That's a sophomore, 75 catches, 1,252 yards, 11 touchdowns. Junior year, upped his catch total by 10 catches, upped his receiving yards by about 70. So 85 for 1,320. So over the last two years, 160 catches combined, over 2,500 receiving yards at Ole Miss. When you see it at an SEC school, you cannot overstate how important that is. 59th percentile is good enough for me. College dominator, 68th percentile. And then you just look at the weight adjusted speed score. 449 for a guy who is six foot, 226 pounds. So 90th percentile speed score. There's not a lot that this guy cannot do. Um, a lot of teams might want to use him as a slot receiver, but he can operate as a slot he can operate outside and we saw that at Ole Miss last year when they dealt with injuries he had to move in and out of the lineup he was productive any part of the field and uh, he'll probably end up playing a lot of outside because they obviously signed Adam Humphreys to a pretty lucrative deal considering who he is as a player so Humphreys is going to be the slot guy of course which means Davis and AJ Brown will be running on the outside do I think AJ Brown will have a big impact in redraft probably not I just think this is a very run heavy offense but he's someone that I will probably be buying a lot of stock in next offseason in Dynasty. So get that rookie production slump out of the way and then just believe in A.J. Brown as a prospect, which I very much do. The one player that was picked between Nikhil Harry and A.J. Brown was Debo Samuel. Debo Samuel, I like this kid out of South Carolina. I actually want to ask you guys, if you're watching this video, comment down below who you think is going to be the most productive. I don't care about ADP. I want, I want like raw production, fantasy points scored. Who's going to be the number one rookie wide receiver this year in raw fantasy points scored? Comment that down below. Hit that thumbs up button while you're down there. Because I'm intrigued. I feel like there are a lot of different options. There's not one clear-cut guy who landed in a perfect spot with a good quarterback, you know, in a great situation. Um, I, I think the, air, uh, the answers will be very varied. And I've heard a few people that really think Debo Samuel could be that guy. 5'11", 214, so good size. He is an older prospect, 23 and a half almost 24 years old. So his route running is going to be crispy. And that's something he was known for coming out of school as an older age wide receiver. Yet you kind of have to be in that conversation as, a, as one of the better route runners. 4.48 four, speed. So that sub 4.5 speed puts him in a great weight adjusted speed score percentile, 80th percentile given his size. He wasn't really that productive in college. He never had a season where he hit 900 receiving yards. 7.83 his sophomore year, 
only one touchdown, was hurt the majority of his 2017 season, his junior year, came back his senior year, caught 62 passes for 882 yards and 11 touchdowns. So that's kind of when he had his breakout year, which is a little late and it's probably a little bit concerning. But when you look at the offense overall, I mean, if there's one wide receiver in this offense you want, it's definitely Dante Pettis. And George Kittle is the one weapon that you want in this offense if you're going, you know, shove for shove. Debo Samuel, uh, I, I, I mean, I could see him being a flex play in PPR leagues eventually at some point during the season, but he's definitely not someone I'm looking to draft thinking that he's going to have a breakout year because we haven't really seen this offense and like what it is with Jimmy G because he was hurt for so long and we haven't seen what they do when they mesh together. I like the dynamic that Samuel and Pettis bring and I like these forward thinking coaches are bringing on players who can do a lot, right? They're, they're very versatile and you can line them up as flanker outside, inside the slot. And that's what both Samuel and Pettis can do. And even Kittle as a, as a tight end who is a, like a freak athlete, right? And can line up kind of anywhere on the field. That's, that's what I like, uh, versatility. But I'm not sure how well that will translate, especially in this rookie year to fantasy production right out of the gate. So I'm not targeting Debo Samuel in redraft leagues, though I think it was a good pick by the Niners player-wise. Later in the second round, we had Mecole Hardman go to the Chiefs. I mean, now that Tariq Hill is not getting any games... You have to very, 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 very intensely loosen your excitement for him. Can he be a playmaker in the NFL eventually? Yes. Do I think he's going to make a big impact in year one? No. There's already so many weapons in Kansas City ahead of him. Tyree Kill, Sammy Watkins, Travis Kelsey, Amy Williams at running back. There are just a lot of things that will happen successfully in that offense before Mikhail Hardman is anywhere near consistent enough. He still has to beat out Demarcus Robinson and... Um, you know, Byron Pringle, he has to contend with whatever, but they did use a high draft capital on him. I'm assuming they thought Terry Kill would probably get some sort of suspension, but he doesn't. So for redraft, McCall Hardman is off my radar. Maybe at one point or another, he will be a redraft uh, waiver wire pickup. Then we have Jaws, JJ Arcega Whiteside out of Stanford. This guy is an absolute beast and I love the landing spot for Dynasty a little more than Redraft. I wish they would just get rid of Nelson Aguilar. Ship him off somewhere so that we know Jaws is going to be on the field for 60 to 65 percent of the snaps. This guy's a beast. 6'2", 225 and it's great. You know I like a lot of these rookie wide receivers man. I know that they got a lot of hype as a class and then as the draft went by and there wasn't like any big big name guys right. No one went within the first 20 picks. We had to wait a while for some of the more polarizing prospects to eventually get picked. But we have a lot of guys who hit a lot of big check marks for me. The size, the speed, production in college, and young breakout ages in a Power 5 conference. Or power five, you went to a Power 5 conference school, right? And if you check a lot of those boxes, there's a good chance that you hit at least as a good NFL wide receiver. And J.J. Arcega Whiteside does that. Stanford, 6'2", 225. 454 40-yard dash puts him in the 88th percentile for weight adjusted speed score. You see his best comparable player is Kenny Galladay. He's a massive target down the field. He's great on deep passes. He's great in the end zone, in the red zone, on contested catches. There's arguably nobody better in the class than this guy. Broke out at age 19, 16.8 yards per reception in college. That is a That tells you that he's a good downfield playmaker. When you look at a guy his size, you don't really necessarily think he could move that well all the time. But I'm telling you, the guy can move very well down the field, and uh, he's going to be a big player in this offense. It's just a matter of when we see that happen, because I think he'll earn his way into a pretty good amount of playtime and, and snaps and stuff in his first year, but it, it's, it's hard to imagine that it's going to be consistent or outside of just a red zone role, because they have a lot of weapons there. Alshon Jeffrey, they brought in Deshaun Jackson, they already have Nelson Aguilar, they have Zach Ertz, Dallas Goddard. Miles Sanders, Jordan Howard, you have so many like that, really good ones in one offense, what I usually do is pivot and just go for the quarterback. And I've talked about Carson Wentz many, 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 many times. I think Jaws will actually surprise and put up pretty good production as rookie year. I think he's good enough and talented enough that he will play his way into a realistic role in the Eagles offense this year. And it will probably come at the expense of Nelson Aguilar. Probably finish with five to six touchdowns. Predicting those weeks is gonna to be tough. So that probably does make him a little bit less valuable in a season long league. But I absolutely love this guy in Dynasty. I think he's gonna be a big time playmaker in this offense, which is just going to be fantastic this year. We'll monitor snaps in the preseason. If we see that he's getting a lot of run with the first team, and if we see over the first few weeks of the season, his snap counts going up and up and up, he could absolutely play himself into a full time role receiver in this Eagles offense. And if that's the case, he's going to be very valuable in redraft. Three more wide receivers that really, really intrigue me at the end of the second round. Tyrus Campbell of the Colts, Andy Isabella of the Cardinals, and DK Metcalf of the Seahawks. One of these guys I think could possibly lead rookie wide receivers in yards. That's Andy Isabella. 
sandwiched in the middle of those two. We'll start off with Paris Campbell. He goes to the Colts, obviously the ultimate landing spot. People who like analytics like Paris Campbell a lot because of what he did at the Combine, and it was ridiculously impressive. Came in over six foot tall, 205 pounds, so it's not like he's a small slot receiver. He ran a 4-3-140 yard dash. 97th percentile weight adjusted speed score. His burst score was in the 90th, 97th percentile. My problem is that he never really had a breakout age. He did not really produce at a high level in college until his final year when he was with Dwayne Haskins, who threw 50 touchdowns last year. It took him a while to do that, right? In his senior year, he caught 90 passes, over 1,000 yards receiving, 12 touchdowns. But you think of someone who runs a 4-3-1 as like a big downfield playmaker. That's not really him. He had two receptions of over 15 yards in college. That's like hard to do. I don't know if I could find someone within the first three rounds that didn't have more than two catches of 15 plus yards. It might have been 20 yards. I forget what the stat was. It was kind of wild with Paris Campbell. He didn't produce that much in college. And for me, that's probably like the most important thing. I like the combine metrics and I like that you're fast and explosive. And I can't ignore the fact that he's in the Colts offense, right? Led by Andrew Luck, of course. But again, there are a lot of good weapons there too. They have T.Y. Hilton as solidified number one. They have Devin Funches, who I think is going to take a lot of red zone um, looks from the talented tight ends that they have there and Eric Ebron, Jack Doyle. We'll have to see what kind of health they have, but they have some depth there with Mo Ali cox behind him as well. Early reports are that Paris Campbell is competing with Chester Rogers. I don't think that's really going to hold up for long, but he does have some work cut out for him still. I don't see the opportunity really being there and redraft in year one for Paris Campbell because there are so many other targets there. I think he'll get a lot of manufactured touches. Like they'll probably run a lot of mesh routes over the middle and get him the ball in space early maybe some screen plays but I don't see them taking many shots downfield to him and the fact that they have so many other red zone weapons like they like to run the ball in the red zone we see Marlon Mack scoring a lot of red zone touchdown or rushing touchdowns down there he throws to his tight ends at a ridiculously high rate and then those big receivers outside who I expect to be Funches he did it with Dante Moncrief a few years ago like I don't really see Paris Campbell being a touchdown threat whatsoever I'd, I'd put his over under this year at touchdowns maybe at three and a half so if he's not making big plays down the field which I could be wrong about of course but that's not who he really was in college if he's not making those big plays down the field he doesn't have much value I, I I think he needs to kind of get into his role first and they need to figure out what exactly they want to do with Paris Campbell before I can really get excited about getting him in redraft. But Andy Isabella is someone that I can actually get excited about. I'm really excited about Christian Kirk. Y'all already know this, right? Christian Kirk is primed for a breakout, and it's mainly because we have this new offense being implemented, right? The area, Cliff Kingsbury. Say it a million times, and I'll keep saying it. I have no idea if this is going to work from an NFL standpoint, but they are going to run a lot of plays, and it's going to be good for their fantasy football prospects with Kyler Murray under center. They're, they're going to have four wide receivers on the field a lot of the time, but I think Andy Isabella is already, you know, there's already reports coming out that he's probably going to be the third wide receiver in these sets behind Fitz and Christian Kirk. So if he's on the field and they're running a ton of plays, he's going to get as many, if not more snaps than the large majority of rookie wide receivers. So even if he's not as good on a per snap basis, the volume of snaps he's going to get is good. And he's an explosive fucking guy. He might be undersized 5'9", 188, but 4'3", speed, the same speed as Paris Campbell, but he also produced in college. He was a ridiculously big playmaker in college. And he played a lot of snaps on the outside. Like just because his size is small does not mean he was a slot receiver, but he can play both inside and outside. When I look at Andy Isabella, I mean, I like Christian Kirk a lot more, but Andy Isabella, I think, is going to eat in production, eat into production because if they're just running a lot of routes over the middle and it's like quick hitting and their plays up tempo, up tempo, up tempo. When you have a guy like Andy Isabella who can, who is a speedster and can get open quickly and can make plays down the field, like he's gonna by default just earn a lot of volume from Kyler Murray. And I think we're gonna be surprised at the number of receiving yards that Andy Isabella finishes his rookie season with. If he's in the 700-ish range. That wouldn't surprise me whatsoever. I think he'll be a legit PPR flex play. And then you have DK Metcalf. If you followed me, you know I'm not a fan of DK Metcalf. He was a guy who in college ran strictly routes from one side. He was injury prone pretty much and banged up a lot of the time. Never had big years in college where he put it all together and was able to produce anywhere near his teammate in AJ Brown at the same school. AJ Brown outproduced him wildly. I know he had injuries. I know this guy looks like a fucking mammoth and he runs like a beast and he blew the combine out of the water, but I just don't, I, I don't think that what he did in college was what I want to see from a prospect. Again, he ran all of his routes from one side. He doesn't have a full tree of routes and we've seen a plenty of these big wide receivers flash the combine and you're like, oh my God, they look like they're going to be such an exciting prospect in the NFL. And then things just don't work out because they're not actual receivers, right? They're just like athletes who are good. Now, he does go to a depth chart in Seattle that has Tyler Lockett, who has barely ever seen over 70 targets in his career in a year. Baldwin retired, so behind Lockett, it's literally Metcalf, Jerron Brown, Gary Jennings. It's all these unproven players who have really done nothing in the NFL. So Metcalf steps into a place, right? At the end of the second round, he gets picked. He steps into a place 
where he could immediately push for a role in this offense. And push for a big role in that offense, I should say. Now, Tyler Lockett should play more in the slot, which means DK Metcalf will play outside. And maybe he doesn't really need to learn all of the routes. Maybe he can be that downfield playmaker stretcher where Lockett takes the Baldwin role and then ironically, Metcalf takes the locket role, right? Downfield playmaker. And we know he's explosive. Off the line, there's arguably no one as good as DK Metcalf. Like, he blows by defenders with his speed. The production just wasn't there in college, and I need to see that in order to believe in a guy. So Metcalf's not a guy I'm looking to draft, to be honest. Uh, if I miss out on him and he does end up being good, I think his ceiling is someone like a, a, a Deshaun Jackson. I don't think his ceiling, like everyone pegs his ceiling as like Josh Gordon. That's, I don't think that's ever going to happen. I think his ceiling, which is still very good, is like Deshaun Jackson in his prime, which is a great downfield playmaker and can develop into like a, a really good outside wide receiver. So we'll have to see what happens with Metcalf. He's not someone I'm looking to draft and redraft, but I wouldn't be surprised if he becomes a, a popular waiver wire pickup. He'll have one or two big games maybe over the first two months of the season, right? And if, if he has an explosive play where he goes for a 50 or 60 yard touchdown, of course, people are going to get excited about it, right? And people are going to be like, oh, he's going to be a top waiver wire pickup or whatever. That makes sense, but those things aren't going to come off, and you're not going to be able to predict those kind of things. So we'll see. Russell Wilson is one of the most accurate deep ball passers, but the volume in the offense is just so low from a passing standpoint that he's going to need to be really efficient on the deep balls. And it's like, do you want to bank on a rookie who I, first of all, just don't believe in him that much as a prospect to also be efficient? It's hard to be efficient as a rookie, man. You're, you're getting your feet wet, and you're still learning the game and the speed and the playbooks and all this and the chemistry with your quarterback. He has a great quarterback to do it with, but I'm not necessarily sold on Metcalf this year. Looking at the rest of the wide receivers, there's probably no one I really like from a redraft standpoint. You have Jalen Hurd, Deontay Johnson, Terry McLaurin, Miles Boykin, Akeem Butler, Gary Jennings. They're all like later round draft capital picks and or in situations where I don't see them exploding right away. You have Deontay Johnson, who was the earliest pick in the third round, but he's also competing behind Juju Vance McDonald, you had James Washington who had high draft, draft capital the year prior. So it's going to be a little bit tough for him to get on the field and really produce any any semblance of like fantasy consistency this year. Jalen Hurd, I think he's going to be more of a role player. He could be like a Cordero, a better version of Corderell Patterson, which is not fantasy relevant at this time. Terry McLaurin, you know, I just don't see it in any of these offenses. We have no idea what's going to go on with the quarterback situation in Washington. Miles Boykin, again, if, I mean, if, if I don't like Marquise Hollywood Brown, then I'm definitely not going to like Miles Boykin on the Ravens. Keen Butler dropped to the fourth round. Apparently, like, he's battling to be the wide receiver four or five right now. He has not gone up the depth chart very well. And a lot of people liked his raw tape, and I did too, but he took forever to break out, and it was at Iowa State. And. If you can't do it until your senior year after being old and, you know, like you need to break out earlier to prove to us that you're actually a good, raw, talented wide receiver and can do it in the NFL at an early age. And it doesn't look like that's going to be Hakeem Butler. So the rest of these guys, I don't really have my eye on right now, to be honest with you. Um, if things change throughout the summer, of course, you will be noted in the Rookie Dynasty Guide. You can catch any of these guides at BigDogsDraftGuide.com, the season long, the Rookie Dynasty. They are on sale now. Went live July 1st. It's got everything in there rankings, season long, dynasty, rookie, broken down by positions, PPR, half PPR, standard, all of the good stuff's in there. Sleepers, busts, must drafts, and a million other exclusive articles. Go check that out, bigdogsdraftguide.com. If you enjoyed the video, I'm fucking shocked because I feel like I didn't really drop that much value. I apologize if the uh, content quality wise was, was not up to par today, man. I'm, I'm hurting. It was a long weekend, but hopefully you did find some value in it. If you did, make sure you hit that thumbs up button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you're new because we're doing everything 2019 fantasy football for the rest of the summer, into the summer, into next year, and forever and ever and ever until I pass away, which I thought was going to be today. The car I drove home, I drove home from the Jersey Shore to Brooklyn, which was an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes with no air conditioning. It's 96 fucking degrees in New York today. And the fuses keep fucking breaking in my apartment so the air conditioning can't even stay on. I can't do this anymore. I can't do it. I can't do it. Cut the camera. Fucking curtains. Oh, 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 oh,